we had a lot of friction between us. I think there was quite a few things that happened behind the scenes that people don't know about. And I started believing what I was reading and the hype. I started getting into the character. I still have a lot of people like calling for me, but I had a lot of people like with the voodoo doll out, you know. There was a time there I literally would go to sleep at night thinking of ways to punch him in the face. Rivalries exist in every sport known to man. Since the earliest days of athletes competing in games of skill and daring, individuals have risen through the ranks and placed themselves at the pinnacle of their sport. In the end of these contests, sometimes brutal in form, one man would stand on the apex with the competition flailing below. But just as every champion rises, there will always be a contender with his sights set on taking down all adversaries and claiming his spot at the top of the field. For every Spartacus, there is a hungry gladiator with sharpened sword and fierce, determined heart. Surfing, like all warrior games, had been forever rife with fierce rivalries. But in 1998, when a young and ravenous competitor named Andy Irons got called up to the big leagues, which was being dominated by five-time world champion and unstoppable force Kelly Slater, the battle had only just begun, and surfing's greatest rivalry was born. don't get pushed by by nothing you know competitively in sports and stuff you get to see what people are made of when they really get pushed their back to the wall and when somebody fills that space two people can't that's when tension happens i remember saying a couple things to him like you know you're not in your backyard anymore and he said something like you know it's ain't Kawhi either and you know the stuff he had said the stuff i'd said it was just to the point where i literally wanted to go and get physical I met Kelly was at the Surf Expo show in Orlando. There was this kid who was very dark skinned and his eyes just lit up and they were very focused and intense. And, um, you know, he talked about, you know, surfing and winning contests and becoming a pro and all these things. We're looking at me out, right? That's what everybody's dream is. Sure, kid. And uh, we'd heard, you know, this kid was really the, the real deal and maybe the next coming of Tom Curran. Growing up in Florida, you don't take surf for granted. Surfing really small waves all the time really teaches you how to read waves better than some guys would be able to read them coming from somewhere else because, you know, trying to analyze a one foot wave versus always surfing, you know, five foot waves and bigger, you got, I think you really got to pay attention to what a wave's doing. And I think that's, that's helped Kelly too. I mean, honestly, since he was little, everybody already knew. You know that he was going to be something big, but when he actually like busted onto the scene, uh, for me it was at the uh, contest at Lowers. He just really had a polished incredible act that just was unbeatable at that point. He was so good and he was uh, definitely stamped his place on, on the surfing world. That's when it kind of separated him and put him on the map as this kid's not just a Floridian, not just an East Coaster, but he's one of the best coming out right now from the U.S. The pressure that probably mounted and built within Kelly himself to sustain and hold that position as a dominant amateur surfer, it's almost unbearable. 
A lot of people said, oh, yeah, he's had too much contest, too much this. He's... The other thing was, oh, he can't surf big waves, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was wide-eyed and, you know, uh, just astounded at Hawaii and probably blown away <laughs> at the waves, the power, the size, the crowds, the intensity in the water, all that kind of stuff. But, but uh, from what I understand, he adapted pretty quickly and he did fine. I don't recall any time there ever being like a, a slowdown transition from, from amateur to pro. He pretty much just, you know, kept climbing. Pretty safe to say I would have thought he would achieve a world title. I wouldn't have forecasted the success he's had to the magnitude that he's had. Still to this day, I have not seen another Kelly Slater. Kauai is such a, an incredible place for waves. Where Andy lives, you know, in Honolulu, where he grew up. He kind of came from nothing, you know. He didn't. He didn't come from you know a lot of money and wealth. He didn't have a lot of money to travel. Yet he was in the perfect place to become what he is, you know, with the waves that he had, that he surfed every day. His whole surfing revolves around instinct, and I think he was able to surf these incredible reef breaks, and also that little competitive zone down at pine trees. This beach break out here is the best training ground on the planet, probably. You know, the boys had that since they were nine, 10 years old. They're so ultra competitive as brothers that there's no doubt in my mind that they're, they're growing up together, helped shape them into the surfers, the dynamic surfers they are today. And all of a sudden, Andy grew, and he got real gawky and, and, and gangly. It didn't look right. You know, he was sprouting, and Bruce was all form and perfect, then it shifted, oh, hey, Bruce is going to be the guy. Look, look at the style, look at the form. And then Andy just, when he turned 16, everything kicked in. Andy was a little kid when Kelly started winning world titles. He guaranteed he watched every single videotape that Kelly had ever been on and dissected it and tried to surf like Kelly, guaranteed. And guaranteed he was Kelly's biggest fan. He had the dominant kind of going to be a world champ attitude when he was a, when he was a young kid. You know, he, he didn't, didn't want to lose. He wanted to win every contest. I think when he really became a household name is when he qualified so quick on the WQS, onto the CT, and then, as we all know, did that huge rise and crash. And he was a brash young kid and cocky when he went on tour. Going into that next level, if you don't have your game tight, no matter who it is, not Andy, not anybody else, the big boys are ready to chew you up and spit you out for breakfast. All of a sudden, he thought, hey, this is me. I'm, you know, I'm a rock star. He kind of got a little little wild and and uh, didn't realize what he kind of had going and got, got swept up in the fast life on tour, which is, is so easy to do. Falling off the tour was a, a rude awakening in a sense, but, but a nice slap of reality. You know, that, that kind of set him on his course. had to work for what they got. It didn't come to them, you know, where it was some sort of legacy or some trust fund kid 
They came from very humble beginnings, both of them. Kelly was bred to be more of a smooth machine, whereas Andy was bred to be a rigid killer. You know, that first year I got back on tour, Andy really stepped it up. He won a couple of contests early in the year, and, and I think that was, that, you know, 2002 was really the, the year of the rise of Andy. Kelly was the best surfer on earth, undisputed. When Andy came on the scene, he was far from the best surfer on earth. You know, I mean, he was an amazing surfer, he had a lot of talent, but he kicked and scratched his way all the way from here to here and like was, you know. You come back into the game after being on a hiatus and then coming back in and expecting to be right back on top and all of a sudden, who's this guy in the ring that keeps knocking me out? Then all of a sudden, that's when a rivalry starts. In 2002, Andy and I had a really, like, we had a lot of friction between us. They would ask me about it and I'd be like, you know what, I don't want to talk about him. You know, he, he won all that stuff back in the day and, you know, that was then, this is now. I think going into 2002, Kelly, for him that was almost uh, sort of a year back and, and recharging his batteries, trying to figure out what it was like to compete again because he hadn't done it for quite some time. And it, it probably came to him as a shock how quickly um, Andy became such a dominant force. At that point, I think it kind of turned, and, and then it let the media natu naturally did what it did and, and helped really, you know, fuel the fire of that that you know, rivalry. World champion, Andy Ryan. I won 2002, and then, yeah, that's when it all of the media I was trying to get used to, but 2003 was wild. I remember reading so much stuff that Kelly had said, and I remember seeing stuff in like Sports Illustrated wrote a total bias article that made me look horrible, and they fabricated a bunch of stuff, which I thought was really heavy, because not even surf mags were doing what Sports Illustrated, this giant magazine, wrote. You know, it's funny because in ways it was totally blown out of proportion in the media, the, the tension between us. And in other ways, people didn't know about it, and it was made more than people thought. I ended up kind of running with it and just kind of going, you know what, yeah, f Kelly. <laughs> when you become obsessed with being the best you can be and winning, you have to come at every angle you can come up with or figure out his good, bad, and uglies of how I'm gonna take this guy down. He's read all those books, I guaranteed it, on the, you know, the art of war, how to get in the other you know, competitor's head. He denies it, and I know he'll say he doesn't do it, but there's no doubt about it. There was a time I went over to house it off the wall, and it was the house she was staying at or whatever. I didn't even know it. I just, I thought that, um, I thought this guy that worked for Boost was staying there. Somebody's like, yeah, Damien's staying at that house. He shows up in my house, walks right in, asking for some guy named Damien. I'm like, what? 
he knew. And he knew I stay in there. He knew. I mean, I'm pretty sure he knew. And Andy was making food in the in the kitchen, and Steve Sherman was there, and he like slyly took a photo of it. Photo. Yeah, the infamous photo. To me, it seemed like a little bit of a mind game. Like he was stalking him, checking out my territory and see what was going on. Because he took it that way, I realized like, whoa, this is like heavier than I even thought. Those guys were at each other's throats mentally, like watching it and like it was that close to seeming like it was gonna turn over into being something even more like physical. We were out practicing for the contest, and just out warming up at pipe, and it was a pretty crowded day. And he was pounding for the wave. And I flipped around and backed him up, and he missed it, and I caught it. And I piled back out, and he just started screaming at me. Just light me up in the water in front of everybody. It was pretty funny. My whole driving force right now is to take his little pretty picture and just crush it. The guy came up to me before the final at the Pipe Masters 2003. Biggest heat of the year, the final, right before it all goes down, comes up to me and pats me on the back. Might have been sincere, might not have. I just want to let you know I love you like a brother. Right before the biggest heat of my life. Like, what? You know, he thought, like, oh, he's playing a mind game with me or something. That's just weird. I don't know how to take that. I blocked it right out, went out and searched my heat. I think at that point, I, I had already given up. I knew I was going to lose. I woke up that morning, and I knew I was going to lose. I was so stressed out. And it was my dad's birthday, and uh, you know he had died the year before. And uh, there was just a lot of things all accumulating. I just wanted that day to be over with. I wanted that year to be over with. I wanted it all to just go away. Kelly put every ounce of his abilities and performance um, into 2003, and he came up just short of beating um, Andy that year. And that was probably one of the most difficult losses I think Kelly ever was able to take. It was tough for me, you know, because I lost, and I that was sort of symbolic of like my life. I was, I felt like I was losing at that time. He wasn't the guy I grew up looking up to anymore. He was the guy that I wanted to beat more than anything, that he was saying all this you know, kind of crap, and I just wanted nothing better than to leave him on the beach with a loss. Go 4 was like, you know, that year to me was just a wash. I just, I just felt like I stayed stuck in the same place I was. Not only was Andy really battling Kelly for real, he was literally schooling him. Like, hands down, regulating him. I never thought I'd see the day. Pure emotion, rage. I just put my heart into it. Everything I had in myself to, you know, whatever it took to beat him. There was a time there I literally would go to sleep at night thinking of ways to punch him in the face. <laughs> That's so good. I remember I was in France one time. I remember I was like, hitting this bag. I was just training one day and I was hitting it and I was just like imagining it was Andy. <laughs> we were so intense, it was so deep, where I would be on the beach with my voodoo doll hoping that he would lose. And every turn I'd be so critical on every turn he did and every way that he caught out by the end I was like he's just being overscored kind of a thing. I thought Andy certainly had the talent and the ability to be able to beat anyone in the world. But to be able to sustain that for three years is unbelievable. Losing is where you start to learn about yourself. Losing's where the good, you know, the good stuff happens inside. The next year I seen just how, how gnarly he can be when he gets on a roll and how he literally just, it's so hard to get him off it.
Jeffries was another good one, but you know, unfortunately, Andy was like really, really bummed at that contest, you know? Kelly needed a 9.3, and he did three turns that were, you know, pretty good. And he fell on his fourth, and I was on the beach, and I saw the wave, and I was like, there's no way they could give him a score, but I couldn't hear him. And they gave him a 9.5, and I saw him claiming in the water. I was like, there's no way, and I was in disbelief. My other score was a little under bald, maybe. So <laughs> maybe they gave me a little psh, psh. I mean, I was really stoked when I won it, but afterwards I was kind of bummed, you know, because Andy was so bummed. You know, I've been in the same case. I've had a heat against him in France, or I should have lost. I should have lost in the semifinals against him. He served a lot sharper, and, and I got overscored on my last wave. I needed an eight, five, and got a nine. He was pissed. If I could tear you from the sea, in Japan, I had such a good contest. I was so on my game, and um, I felt really, really good about that. When they were competing, it was nothing for them to be behind by a 9.5 with 30 seconds left in the heat. In Japan, and he pulled out a 9.6, I think it was, or could have even been a 10-point ride, literally with 30 seconds left to go in the heat. Fair and square, he won. I was still stoked, you know? He, he outdid me in the final. Kelly had rivals, you know? There was, there was times in Kelly's career where a guy would really give him a run for a year, whether it be Sonny or whether it be Shane Beshin at one point or Rob made a run for like six months or something, but it was never super significant and it was never equal. You know, competitively in sports and stuff, you get to see what people are made of when they really get pushed their back to the wall. And that's really what the spirit of competition is about. Can guys on the same level go at it? I think he's pushed me as much as Tom Curran has, you know? I think it's taken me through competition to a place that I don't think I could have ever gotten to. I got so close that one year, it would have been like four titles, I would have been so stoked. I mean, I'm still stoked with three, but that fourth one, the one you don't get, it's always the one you want the most. Right. And uh, you know, the next year he won by like a thousand points. Like I wasn't even close to him. 